Oh, ground in with this land that we're on. So if you feel comfortable, close your eyes or just lower your eyes. Feel your feet on the ground, whether it's on the floor, on the carpet, on the earth, whatever your feet are on, just make contact there. And taking a big deep breath, let it go. And taking this next deep breath through your feet, as if you're breathing in through your feet. So breathe some of that earth energy up into your belly. And then let it go. And do that again. Breathe in through your feet, up your legs, into your belly. And as you let it go, imagine it expanding out 360 degrees around you. So you're like filling out your energy bubble. And breathe in again through your feet up into your belly. And expand out into your energy bubble. This time open up the top of your head, your crown chakra up there and breathe in through that top of your head. Breathe in some sky energy all the way down backbone into your belly and again as you let it go fill up your energy bubble feel yourself taking up more space and again breathe in through the top of your head down your spine into your belly and out into your energy bubble and just feel these two currents of energy one coming up from the earth one coming down from the sky meeting in your belly The next time that you breathe in, feel them both. Feel the earth energy coming up, the sky energy coming down. And breathe out into your energy bubble. And tap into your heart and be aware of your gratitude for this land that you stand on, that you sit on, that nurtures you, that feeds you provides you with air to breathe and water to drink. And feel that gratitude in your heart. And as you breathe out, let it fill up that space around you. Take two more breaths of gratitude. Whenever you're ready, open up your eyes. Come back here and now. Mm. Mm, thank you for joining us, all of you. It's so beautiful to see you all. So we're going to be doing some, some storytelling tonight. We're going to be working with some really old stories, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story that I've chosen in a while. Um, but first, a little statement of my intention with this. Uh, we use a lot of, of storytelling at, with the Rites of Passage Council in various different ways. They are an incredible source of information that's traveled across space and through time to be with us. So those that have survived have something to tell us. And what they have to tell us is different for each of us. So we're gonna, we're gonna hear the story and then we're gonna have time for thinking about the story, unpacking the story a little bit, discussing the story. And we'll find that it has a different message for each of us. Yes, there'll likely be themes, but each of us are gonna to respond to it in a different way because we're each at different, different places on the planet. We just discovered that. We're also at different places in life. We have different things that are alive for us right now. So we're all gonna experience it differently. So I just wanna, say that up front to say that there's no right or wrong way to interpret this story. It's going to land for each of us differently. And I want to really respect that, that everybody has is going to have their own experience with it. So as we create the space together for the next hour and a half or so, I would like to put out a few, few requests and I'm open to hearing others in terms of how we engage with, with each other. Um, one is that we are authentic that we feel free to say whatever feels authentic to us in that moment. That we're respectful of each other and of anyone else that may be mentioned. That we're compassionate with each other again. And that we're generous, which means being generous with our thoughts. And if you feel a bit nervous about saying something, 
just say it anyway, bring your voice into the circle. We'd love to hear from everybody. Um, be generous in your sharing. We each, we're each gonna learn from each other. That, that's the way these stories work. So I'm putting out those four requests, authenticity, respect, compassion, generosity. Are there any others that you'd like to add in terms of our, our time together here? Anything else that feels important to be spoken before we jump in? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourselves. I'm going to take the silence as a no, but it's an open invitation if you want to pop something in the chat at some point. Yeah, so medicine stories, folk tales, fairy tales, legends, myths, all of these things we've been working with. I think the one I'm going to tell tonight fits into the category of folk tale, although it's bordering on legend. We'll come to that. Um, but yeah, they are a, they are a form of medicine. They are a form of healing. They're probably the oldest healing art um, that we know of as humans. Maybe that and music are our oldest healing arts, ways to bring community together, ways to transmit knowledge, um, ways to receive healing. And as I said, they're gonna, they're gonna hit us all differently. So be aware as I go through, I'm gonna start with the story and then we're gonna discuss it. So be aware as I go through the story, um, what happens for you? You may find yourself coming in. You may not land in the story until like I'm midway through it. There may be a certain thing that like pulls you in an image or word or something that like pulls you in and you're like, oh, now I'm here. I'm fully in the story. Or it may be that you're, you're in the story from the beginning and at some point you get left behind. Maybe you get left on a, on a windy beach somewhere when I've traveled onto the mountains. Or maybe you're still in the mountains when I'm back at the castle. That's okay. Notice that, it's all information. You may fall out of the story. You may find a rabbit hole in the story that takes you off into some whole other story that I'm not even aware of. All of those things can happen and probably many other things. And that's, that's part of the, the medicine of the story. So, so trust that like wherever it is that you go in this story, whatever parts stick with you, whatever parts you just pass over, that's all information. Just, just pay attention to where, where you go, where you land in the story, where you come in, where you drop out, and which images stick with you. And that's part of what we'll work with afterwards to sort of to pull for you. What is the medicine for you? What's the message for you? Um, so just pay attention to what happens inside of you as we, as we go through the story. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions before I jump into this particular story. You may continue to hear this pinging as people arrive. I will do my best to let them in as we go. Okay, sounds like no questions. So uh, I'm gonna jump into this story. So this is a story from Celtic mythology. It's actually specifically from Ireland, uh, which is close to my home. I'm from uh, the borderlands of England and Scotland. That's where all of my ancestors are from, I'm from very close in, on that border. Um, that's where I grew up on actually both sides of that border. So the Celtic, Celtic myths are close to my heart and something I've been digging into more recently. Um, this particular story comes from the, the Finn cycles, which if any of you are familiar with any Irish uh, mythology are, are popular, um, and seems to date probably from about the 15th century, the battle that is referred to in the story has been traced by historians to about the 15th century, as best we can tell. Uh, so it's an, it's an old story and it's been traveling with us for a long time. And as all of these stories have, they've changed and morphed and things have been added. And I wanna acknowledge uh, Sharon Blackie who wrote the book, uh, When Women Rise, If Women Rise Rooted. Um, she, I, I received this story from reading her book. Um, there's a few other versions of it. I found a few various versions of it, but I really like her version, which hopefully will become clear as we go through. So I just want to acknowledge where this story has come from. It's traveled to me and I'm passing it to you. And some of you may already have, have heard it. Um, so if we're ready and there are no questions. Still coming in. Hey, Eliza, can I make, hi, 
can I make you a co-host and you can admit people while I'm talking? That would be really helpful. Let me see how I do that. It doesn't look like I have the ability to do that. Okay, I will try and do my best to multitask. <laughs> All right, so once upon a time in a land not too far away in a time long, long ago, there was an old king and he was very powerful in the continent that we now call Europe. He ruled most of that land. His name was Daradon. And he was known across the continent for his bravery and his large crew of warriors that would roam around invading lands and taking lands. And he became very powerful. And he took it upon himself that he thought, well, it's about time that I invaded Ireland. It's a beautiful country, it's fertile, it's green, and I haven't invaded it yet. So I'm gonna go and invade it. This is what they say, he was thinking. And uh, part of the reason was, yeah, it's a beautiful land, it's very fertile, and he hadn't been there. But also we know that part of the reason was that he knew of Finn. Finn Machumel was known throughout the land as being a very, very brave warrior. And some say he was connected to the magical beings in Ireland, and that's where he got some of his power from. So Dare Don was curious. He wanted to go not only meet this person, he wanted to conquer, to overcome this person. He wanted to find out if it was true, if this person was as strong and as brave as warriors he had been made out to be. And there was rumors that Finn Machumel had eloped with the, not only the wife, but also the daughter of the King of France, who was a good friend of Derdon. So he was seeking revenge and he was curious and he was seeking around. He had a big mission. So he gathered together a troop, an army and many ships and they made their way from the mainland across the waters to the south of what we now call Ireland. But Finn knew he was coming. And so he gathered his warriors and they were waiting for him on that beach. And when they arrived, they arrived at a place we call Ventry now, it's in uh, County Kerry in the Southwest of Ireland. And if you've ever been to Ireland, you know that the wind was probably blowing pretty strong. It was likely that it was raining and the waves were crashing up on the cliffs. But there was enough of a beach that their ships could come in and could land. And so they found safe passage through the waves and landed on the beach. And the greatest battle of all time ensued between Daredon's men and those of Finn Mach Pumel, who was waiting for them. Some say they fought for a year and for a day, and it went on and on and on. It was a ferocious battle. And it seemed like at some point that, it, that Finn's men were not winning. It was going badly for them. There was a lot of suffering and a lot of death. And so he called upon the Tusa de Dunan, the folk, the fairy folk that live under the land. He called upon them. And because he was in right relationship with them, they came. And they galloped out of their, the places they live under the hills, they galloped out and they came to his aid. And with their help, the battle, the tide of the battle turned and Finn's men started to win. And he knew he wouldn't have done it without the support of the, of the great ones who came to his assistance. And after it was all done, from one of the ships emerged a woman, who it turns out had been there all along. But she was the beloved daughter of Derdan. Her name was Mish. She had long black hair and big dark eyes and pale skin. And she had been guarded by a group of men deep in one of the ships while the battle went on. And now she emerged out of the ship as everything seemed to be quiet. And she ran frantically across the beach looking for her beloved father, wondering, where is he? Where is he? Please, please, God, please let him be safe. 
She frantically ran across the beach until she stumbled on his body. He had been decapitated and was covered in wounds. And in her agony and her grief, she fell upon his body and she began to lick at his wounds, hoping, hoping that somehow she could bring life back to his body by kissing him and holding him and licking his wounds. But to no avail, it wasn't working. He wasn't coming back. And when she began to realize this, she staggered up to her feet, wailing. She clawed at her face clawed at her clothes, screaming in agony of this loss. And those that were there say that she let out an ear-piercing, blood-curdling howl that shook the bones of those who were watching from the beach. And as she did this, wings grew out of her shoulder blades. And with another howl, she flew up into the air. She took off leaving behind her the wasteland of this ragged, bloody beach. And she took off to the mountains. And so it was that Mish came to rest in the mountains that we now call the Silver Mish, the mountains of Mish. And she was a crazed creature. She grew fur on her naked skin. She grew feathers to cover herself. Her nails grew into talons. She ran like the wind through those mountains. People were terrified of her. She hunted and ate whatever, whatever animals she came across. She would dismember and destroy any people that came up into her mountains. She was a ferocious sight. All the people were afraid of her. She became known as dangerous as a wild woman. And they built a desert, the people of County Kerry built a desert essentially around the mountains. They removed all the cattle and all the people. And so there was this, this shield around the mountains so that Mesh wouldn't destroy anybody. They were terrified. And the king was at a loss of what to do. He put up a handsome reward. He offered half of his kingdom and many bags of gold and silver coins and the hand in marriage of Mish to any warrior who could go up there and bring her back, return her to her sanity and bring her back into the society, into the kingdom. But they were too scared. They'd heard all these stories of her dismembering people and none of the warriors wanted to go up there. Until one day, a gentle, handsome man, who was a harpist, he played the harp, he stepped forward his name was Dove Rush, which in old Irish means dark wood or dark knowledge. Dove Rush. And he stepped forward and he said, I will do this. I will go and reclaim Mish. And all the warriors that sat around in the king's court laughed and jeered and made fun of him. There's no way you can do this. You're a musician. You're carrying a harp. She's going to tear you to pieces. But he was unfazed. He had a plan. And he said to the king, all I need is a, is a purse of gold and silver coins and I will return with Mish. So the king wasn't very convinced, but he didn't have an alternative plan. So he decided to go with it. And he said, okay. And he handed him the, the purse of gold and silver coins. So Dove Rush found his way up into the mountains and he started to head across that that desert, that barrier that it had been had been created and, and into the mountains towards her lair. And he found a clearing in an oak wood by a pool. The sun was coming through the trees and he thought this is a good place. So he took off his clothes and he laid down his woolen cloak on the ground and he sat down. He took the gold and silver coins out of the purse and he placed them in a circle around him on the cloak. He took out his harp and he began to play. He was strumming, playing, enjoying the music in the woods. He heard a rustling behind him. He tried not to look, but he glanced back and he saw her. She was ferocious, covered in fur and feathers and claws and sharp teeth. He just kept playing. He didn't look at her. He just kept strumming his harp. 
Then a craggy pointed finger came out of the bushes and pointed at his harp and she said, I remember such things. I remember that from my father's court. And Davrosh, he just kept playing and he said, yes. Yes, would you like to sit and, and hear me play some? And she shook her head and she stepped back into the bushes and was gone. So he just kept playing. He were, tried to ignore her, but he was watching out the corner of his eye. Wasn't sure if she was gonna come at him from behind. So he kept playing his harp and he heard another rustling. So again, he glanced over his shoulder just to make sure he saw her. And again, a pointed finger came out of the bushes and she pointed to the golden and silver coins. She said, I remember. I remember things like that, these beauties, these jewels that would sparkle in my father's court. And Davrush said, yes, why don't you come and sit with me and you can look at them and listen to me play the harp. Mm -hmm. She shook her head and she backed back into the bushes. So he kept playing and then he, he decided to, to reorganize himself on his, on his cloak. And as he moved around, his fine set of genitals became very clear to Mish. And he just played his, played his harp and he heard the rustling in the bushes again. This time she stepped out and she looked at him and he could see a flush rising in her face. He just kept strumming his harp and she stepped closer and he put out his hand and he said, will you come and sit with me? And she did. She stepped in across the circle of silver and gold coins and she came and sat with him on his cloak. And he said, no, you're not gonna be hurting me, are you, Mish? She shook her head and she smiled and she seemed enchanted. And so it was that the gentle harpist, Davrush, and the mad woman of the hills, Mish, made love on that woolen cloak that day. And when it was over, she asked for more music and she received more music. And then she asked for more loving and she received more loving. And then she picked up one of the silver coins and she handled it and she simply said, I, re I remember, I remember. And Davrush saw a little tear come from her eye. They were hungry. He rustled around in his bag to see what he had. He had some, he had some bread. It wasn't much, but they shared it. And they were still hungry. So Mish got up and she said, I got this. She ran off into the woods, Whew! speed of light. Off she went into the woods. She came back half an hour later with an entire dead deer. And she started to just bite into it with her sharp teeth and pull it apart with her fingers raw. And he was like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'll roast it for you. So he built them a fire and he roasted the deer over the fire and he fed her roasted deer meat. More music, more love. And as the day wore on and the sun, sun began to soften, he encouraged her over to a pool that was just there that had been warmed by the sun. He took her hand and he encouraged her in and she slipped into the pool with him and he gently began to scrub on her skin and wear off a little bit of that fur and some of those feathers and wash off some of that dirt, forest dirt that was all over her. And he stayed with her. He built a shelter out of sticks and made a bed of moss. And they slept there under his woolen cloak. And he stayed, he stayed a few more days. And each day he'd invite her into the pool of water and he'd wash her a little bit more and gently scrub her skin. And those feathers started to come off and the fur started to come off and the dirt started to come off. And he would comb her hair and he'd trim her fingernails and he'd play music and they'd eat food and they'd make love and sleep. And he stayed. And this went on and on and on. Some say two months they were up there doing this. 
And as he combed her hair and he washed her and he made food for her, he talked to her of the other world, the world she'd left. He just gently spoke of it. Until one day, Mish said, I want to go back. I'm ready. I'm ready to go back. And so they packed up their few little things and he wrapped her in his cloak and they headed down the hills and they headed to the castle. And indeed, they were handsomely rewarded. The king was delighted. This was a problem he'd been trying to solve for some time. And he gave he gave Mesh and Davros a huge amount of land and more gold and silver coins and all the wine they could drink and uh, set them up with a lovely little home. And they lived very happily for many years. It is said she bore him four sons. And one day, Dove Rush was out hunting mushrooms in the forest. And those warriors, those ones from the king's court who had jeered at him and laughed at him, were now feeling pretty resentful. And their pride was hurt. They thought, well, we could have done this. Why didn't we do this? They were, they were too afraid to even try and, and he had been successful. So they felt revenge. So one, that day when he was out hunting mushrooms, they came upon him in the forest and they killed him. And they left his body there for Mesh to find. And as she came upon the mangled body of another loved one, this time she didn't lose her reason. She didn't crack and fly up into the air. Instead, she poured all of her grief into a song, into a lament that she sung. She sat vigil over his body for three days and she sung and she sung and she sung and she poured out all her grief. And it's said that if you go up in those mountains, even today, and the wind is just right, you can hear her singing. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So what's stirring in you? I see various different facial expressions as I look at those with the video on. I'd love to know what, what's stirring, just first, first thoughts as you hear that story, as you take it in. I know there's a lot and we're gonna get deeper into it, but I'd love to hear first, what, yeah, what's stirring? And feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. So my first response and resonance was with the music. Mm -hmm. and how how music can heal and encourage us to change mm -hmm. and I just it really resonates with me because I sing with people mm -hmm. who are on the threshold and um, and I think about what it does for me when I sing you know with other people and uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. and also, yeah, yeah. But, you know, also like the grief, mm -hmm. I, I found that really moving because I think so many of us are grieving mm -hmm. in this last year mm -hmm. and to bring it into a song is, um, that just seems very moving to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. interesting story thank you for listening yeah yeah so the music in the in the harp music but then also in her song at the end yeah it's a very healing it's a healing modality and it's a language it's a way of communicating he used that to communicate with her and there's this sort of common perception those warriors in the king's court who laughed and jeered who thought well that's nothing. What's he going to do with his harp? You know that they didn't they didn't value that as a as a powerful tool, but in fact it it was. Yeah. What else is stirring out there? Yeah, Constance. One of the things uh, you know, so I what resonated with me was that she really was a trauma victim, 
and that he was um, provided the healing and he was very patient and um, in trying to enter earning her trust and making her feel safe. So he was very respectful. And um, so I was impressed with how he went about helping her. I mean, and I really saw it that it wasn't just meeting his needs, but it also was helping her. Right. And so, so I guess that would say it was love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yes, definitely a trauma, trauma survivor. Um, yeah, went through a lot of trauma. And uh, this gentle, compassionate man was able to help her heal. Yeah. Who else is moving out there? I'm... I'm feeling the um, the way that her that Mish that Misha's wildness uh, was seen as a problem, and mm. and also I mean that that she had to protect herself um, as she went into like her dark wild nature her. Uh, that, that deep place of kind of returning her soul back to the earth. And I'm thinking about how the collective uh, wasn't able to handle that mm. and how it was something that needed to be solved with by, by taming. Mm -hmm. And also I'm thinking about how you know, she had to be brought down from that mountain. And yet there were these flickers of like, of, of old healing, like ancient healing practices of the, the harp music of ceremonial cleansing mm -hmm. and how those were utilized to, to heal that trauma, right? She wasn't, yeah, like uh, Constance, I love how you say, it. yeah, she was a trauma victim. No doubt, she she was somebody a survivor. She was a trauma survivor, right? And she survived with the the help of the wild. Yet, it was it was seen as something that that you know, like the, I, I'm recognizing how the the collective is still working on like the there's so many elements of that story that are beautiful, and yet also paint the picture of the, those times too, or and I think about how um, how re returning to that wild nature can bring up deep seated griefs within us, and how can and like the question I'm left with is how can we not you know kill the the healer within um, and yet also embrace that. A land where we meet our wild soul, mm -hmm. and and where where is the interplay? When do we need to come down from the mountain, and when can we make a see it as a pilgrimage that mm -hmm. we take, um, and know that we'll return, and know that it's a sacred space for our healing, and that that and that the feathers and the fur that grow off of us are marks of where we've been mm -hmm. yeah yeah beautiful Liza thank you so much for that perspective CTRT is smiling because I know you've been there up that mountain um yes absolutely yeah and we because it's not told from her perspective we don't know what happened when she was up there for all those years we don't know what transformation she went through her dark night of the soul that happened up there. We don't know the details of that because that's not ours to know. That's hers to know. And that's the, the nature of those kinds of journeys, those kinds of soul descents is what you're talking about, Eliza, um, where we go into those dark, wild places. And we may or may not return. Some part of us, some version of us returns, usually. Um, but what happens in between is, is between you and spirit. Yeah, any other thoughts or what's what's the, not so much thoughts i'm interested in feelings what's stirring yes maya i wanted to share that um i, I was triggered by two things two um 
well, first of all, I love the story. So thank you for sharing. I haven't heard it before. But the one thing was, is that when she picked up the coins and she said, oh, I remember that from my father's court. For some reason, it just felt something like sad, stern in me. So, and the next thing, and I understand the story that she came back into the world and all that. But when uh, her lover was killed again, I just thought like, again, it made me sad. And I thought, well, what's the point? It's just better to remain wild and that's it. Mm, yeah, I feel bad. Yeah, and who knows what was best for her, but it sounds like for those few years, she was happy with him. And some of the growth came from that, some new chapter emerged and she moved on, but yeah. yeah. And the remembering, yeah, the remembering of, and I think this is a little bit of what you were touching on, Eliza, the remembering of how life used to be, which she can never go back to because that's gone, her father's gone. Um, but knowing that there are, there's different worlds in which we can walk depending on what the soul needs at that moment. I see a couple of different hands. Wendy. I think when you were saying in the beginning, oh, yeah this becomes very, you know, individual and personal on how we respond to it. Um, I know the story because I had read Sharon's book and listening to you and, and you told it so beautifully. I, I thought, I wonder if I will respond differently. And, and I didn't. And this, it says more about me, <laughs> just the story, because my response was when she grew feathers and fur and talons, I was like, yeah way to go like you know let let's have that again you know let your wildness come out so for me when she sort of got seduced by this man i was sort of like oh no come on like be who you are but but i also know uh, uh, that that's mirroring me and my projection is there's got to be more than that i mean don't give in to this again um so so yeah for, for me it was real twist and turnish and, and say it made me look at myself and going isn't that interesting that i was rooting for the stay wild because i saw it as and you can see it as she's protecting herself by growing these things to protect you know building that wall or you can see it as she became you know very true and very authentic and and was liberated from from the shackles but i'm saying an awful lot there on on how i view things so you know again there's no right there's no wrong there's only a right and a left and it's just different perspectives but um yeah that that's that was the sadness i felt was was sort of stay wild <laughs> but that's me that's because that's me <laughs> so so anyways thank you yeah it was it was lovely to revisit that again <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for reflecting deeply on yourself there. Um, yes, and I, I saw you, Eliza, like, yes, there's that call to, to, to be in that. And I think that's part of the medicine of this story is like, we can all be in that at times and that that's okay. Um, and we can move back and forth. I see uh, Kylie. Oh, thank you. Um, I felt really deeply at that, uh, the blood curdling scream when that grief just grabbed her, that brought memories for me. But what I felt was really powerful was that while we don't really understand what happened during that time for her, the thing we do know is that scream turned into a song. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was really telling of the transformation that takes place when you've felt something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful reflection. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, yeah, for me, that's one of the, the biggest pieces that I get from this story is that I too have been grabbed by grief and uh, yeah, it makes me want to scream and rage and throw things and, all, all the things <laughs> and that and that from that learning comes a different way of being with it yeah thank you Kylie Carmen I see your hand too hi um you know uh, there were uh, 
many different points in the story that touched me and uh, most of them have already been brought up. Uh, first of all, the when he was washing her and the, the grief that she had experienced that had become this, this, this uh, fur and feathers and talons, you know, the love with which he was uh, washing her started to take away all of that. And to me, this is a reminder of the mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. We carry our trauma, you know, in our physical external bodies. So I thought that part was really beautiful. And uh, the way you told the story, you know, that portray the, the patients um, and a little bit every day and a little bit more and, you know, slow but, slow but uh, steady. Um, and then the, the second part is at the very end of the story, you know, after her, her love was killed by this very vengeful man and she finds him, I thought that she was gonna grow fur and feathers again. But instead, she turned her grief into song. Mm -hmm. So to me, this shows how the power of the love that she, and I don't remember the name, but the harpies, the power of the love they shared was able to transform her fury mm -hmm. to a three day long song. Mm -hmm. Um, of grief, maybe, I mean, could have been a song of many things. So it's a story of transformation in a way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, his name was is Dove Rush, and I apologize if there's any uh, Irish Gaelic speakers out there for my pronunciation of that, that's the best I've got. Um, but I, I've seen it translated as either dark woods or dark knowledge, which is an interesting Pairing. Yeah. Laura. Yeah, I um I felt the story really, really personally. I laid down and I just cried and cried. And um it just reminded me perfectly of my process with my husband. I felt like I was really traumatized when him and I met and going through that whole process of learning to trust someone and let them love me. So I just felt like it was exactly that dance of healing trauma and um, allowing yourself to be really truly loved after, after, um, all you've seen is death and destruction and pain. And, um, and the, the fact that he was so patient um, and just kind of gave her these little hints of things from this life that she once knew, you know, and that he didn't at all pressure her to go back or hold the story in his heart that he was gonna go back and be rich. He just was there present with her every moment of this journey, just being with her. And it just made me really, really present to how powerful love is and how transformative love is and how blessed we are to be able to have love, you know, and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and you. one thing you said is really sticking in my mind is, is you use the word allow, we would allow ourselves to be loved again. Yeah, because mm -hmm. she really did that. It took three invitations, but on the third one, she allowed it. And that, that's, that's a huge step for someone who's had their heart broken, yeah, to allow, allow it to open again, knowing, knowing that it's going to get broken, 
<laughs> they always do in some way. Um, but that we keep opening to that and knowing that we can hold it and that we'll be okay. And yeah, there may be a period on the mountain when we're covered in fur and that's okay. We'll come back some way, somehow. Mm. Yeah, any other 